الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله In the name of Allah the most merciful the most compassionate all the praise to our Lord may his peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and his pure and immaculate progeny and family and his righteous companions and upon you my dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh in the previous sessions we discussed the role of the Muslim community in the West <coughs> excuse me in North America in Canada in the United States in Europe and I mentioned that our role is based on two things one is to maintain our families maintain their spiritual well-being maintain their intellectual integrity maintain their faith their commitment to their Islam to the Holy Quran to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the family of the Prophet Ahlul Bayt This is our duty. We must do everything possible to strengthen the ties of our children, our family members, and ourselves too with Islam, with our Lord, with our Islamic, purely Islamic traditions, not tribal or national or local customs Islamic tradition and the other part or the other side of our life there and our duty and responsibility and task in the West is to convey this beautiful message of Islam to others to non-Muslims it's a pity that we live in America, in Canada, in Europe and we get everything from there but we don't give anything in return. We must give the good things that we have. We must try to raise awareness about Islam, propagate for Islam, disseminate our religion through wisdom and good admonition admonishment Islam was introduced to China not by scholars they happened to be merchants in other parts of the world Islam reached through businessmen through merchants through trade and business and slowly slowly Islam started to grow in these countries we can do the same if we know the way we can succeed some people give up on the non-muslims they say non-muslims are not going to accept Islam no matter what because they have different mentality different you know structure different character different priorities and they are not going to accept Islam this is not right it's not right to say this Americans are human beings Europeans are human beings Canadians are human beings Australians are human beings they learn they learn many of them are eager to learn and grow and change But either we don't have the means, we don't have the 
enthusiasm to do that and we don't pursue these fields. I'm not saying we can change the entire American continent into Muslim devotees within 20 or 30 or 50 years. I'm not suggesting that. Let me ask you, when America was created first as a continent, was it a Christian country? It was not. Even after ages, America was not a Christian society. Slowly, slowly, the immigrants who came from Northern Ireland, from England, from uh, Italy, from France, from Germany, from the Netherlands, from East, Eastern Europe, they converted the people there, the indigenous in America. They converted them through missionaries and churches. Evangelism, they converted them into Christians. It was not a Christian country. Even Europe was not a Christian country. Christianity was born in Palestine. But then after the time of Jesus, peace be upon him, some of his disciples, his followers, they came and they started working hard. And the one who was working very hard was Saint Paul, who used to be Saul. And he is the one who convinced the Roman emperor to embrace Christianity. Of course, Christianity, which was Saint Paul's version, not Jesus Christ's version. And once the government became a Christian, then of course, the government has unlimited resources and they started disseminating Christianity throughout Europe. This is how Europe became a Christian country and America became a Christian country. Originally, it was not a Christian. What's wrong with us, the Muslims? What's wrong with our religion? Why we don't work? The one who works succeeds and the one who's lazy does not succeed. So to say that, to argue that there is no point in a preaching and working because those people are who they are. They are not going to change. You are wasting your time and wasting your energy. This is not correct. We have to work hard and harder to try to reach out to others, to bring Islam to others. And I said there are few steps that we must take. Number one, I mentioned yesterday three of these steps. Number one, our akhlaq and our manners should be based on honesty and truth, integrity, reaching out to others, helping others. It would not help if we read the Quran for them and we give lectures on Islamic theology and Islamic you know, jurisprudence. But we, we the Muslims, we don't act upon our, upon our instructions and our religion. It would not help. The talk or the act should match the talk. The act should match the talk through honesty, through integrity. When people look at Muslims, when they look at Muslim individuals and Muslim families, being honest, being tolerant, being a, a plus to the society, speaking the truth, speaking the truth. Recently, before I came to Iraq, one week before the month of Ramadan, I attended a conference in New York City. In that conference, I met a professor of Islamic studies from Chicago. 
and he told me a nice story, an inspiring story. He said, I traveled to Turkey for a conference and after one of the sessions of that conference, we decided to go for dinner with some friends. So we left the hotel, we got a taxi into the taxi and I, uh, then we reached to a restaurant and when the dinner was over, I put my hand in my pocket to get my purse to pay for the, for the food. I did not find my purse. So I was upset and I was sad. And it is embarrassing when you invite someone or a group of people to a restaurant and they are your guest and you tell them it's on me and then when you want to pay there is no money so he said I realized that I must have missed or dropped my wallet my wallet in the cab in the taxi that took us from the hotel to the restaurant so he said I knew that I'm going to get this wallet back because I said to myself I said this is an Islamic society a good Islamic society and definitely there would be some good people here in this society they'll bring me this wallet he says when we went to the hotel at the lobby they called me and they said there is something for you here I went there and I found my wallet Apparently the driver came back to the same hotel where he picked them up from, from it and he took the wallet back. And he said, this is someone, a guest, who is staying at this hotel and he dropped his wallet in my car. In my car. This is an act of integrity and honesty, an act of manhood. Imagine if this if that driver would have taken the wallet. Imagine maybe he would make a couple of hundreds of dollars. But then when he decided to give it back to its owner, he gained more than $200. He gained, his country gained, and his religious gained too. Imagine this a professor now goes and he tells the story to others. We were over dinner where he told us the story, not in his speech. And now I am telling you this story and thousands of people are hearing this story. So his religion gained, his community gained of that Turkish taxi driver. $200 would not make him really rich would pay him for, let's say, a couple of meals in Turkey. But when he decided to be honest and take that money back, he created a future for himself. He created dignity and izzah and honor for himself. Beside, beside, and moreover, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward him for this act of honesty. لَا دِينَ لِمَنْ لَا أَمَانَةَ له. The hadith says someone who does not have honesty and integrity and he takes the money away, he steals the money, he has no deen, he has no faith, even if he prays. But the one who decided to give it back, things that do not belong to him, to give it back, this person has a deen. He also is going to grow spiritually is going to be stronger and stronger. Imagine the role of honesty, al-amana, honesty, integrity. Then I mentioned the second way of inviting others is to encourage them to come to good Islamic centers, good Islamic lectures, good lecturers, professors, giving them good Islamic books. 
Europeans and Americans and Canadians, they, they love to read. They love to read. Give them an, a good Islamic book, an aspiring one. Let them get to know Islam. Then the third thing I mentioned, which contributes into spreading and disseminating Islam for the thirsty hearts of the people is respecting multiplicity and diversity of the European and the American societies. If you live in an Afghanistan or Iran or Iraq or Lebanon or Egypt or Morocco or Saudi Arabia, you live in a country where there is one race, one language, one color, one customs, one mentality. But when you live in Europe, Europe is diverse. When you live in America, America is the most diverse country on earth. Many cultures, many religions, many traditions, many languages, and they are all respected and they are all have freedom. So we have to honor this. We have to honor this diversity, not to dishonor it or crush it. We have to honor it. How do we honor it? When we do not think of ourselves, my race or your race, to be superior to others. If I, which is an Arab descending from Quraysh, if I want to consider myself to be better than you just because I'm an Arab, just because my language and my blood is an Arab, I would hurt myself and I would hurt my race and my ethnicity and my religion and I would hurt you too. If you do the same because you are Afghani or Iranian or African or Chinese or whatever, also you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt others. People by nature, they dislike prejudice. They dislike racism. They dislike uh, discrimination. But if you are an open-minded and tolerant person and diverse, you respect all. You're going to gain respect too by others. Some people hurt Islam when they think that their race is better than others. They are not a plus for Islam. They are a burden on Islam. They are a stigma on Islam. Islam is not the religion of racism. Islam is the religion of multiplicity and diversity. Inna akramakum indallahi atqakum. The reason why Islam succeeded and was able to bring huge number of followers is because it's the religion that honors diversity and multiplicity. There is no credit or superiority for someone who is Arab over a non-Arab except with piety. If someone is pious, then Islam says this is my true citizen. And we take a pride in this principle of diversity in Islam. The fourth point I want to mention today, that if we want to really make Islam a beautiful religion in America, a moving forward religion in America and in Europe and in the West and in the whole world, we should not be a burden, we as, as, as immigrants, Muslim immigrants, we should not be a burden on the system. We should be a credit to the system, an integration to the society. What do I mean by that? Many people who are irresponsible, they land in Europe, in different countries of Europe, in North America. And the first thing they think of is to be a burden on the system, especially on the healthcare, on the social security. 
they can afford medical insurance, but they don't want to pay since the system is paying for them. And they cheat, they lie, they don't speak the truth. They hide their money, their cash money, so they become a burden on the system. Or social security too. They are not in need for that money. They have good income, but still, because they have agreed, they take advantage of the generosity of that system. This is un-Islamic, unethical. This is not good. This is not only hurting you as an individual or as an, a family. This would hurt your religion too. People will say that, look at Muslims. They come to this country and they do nothing but to be a burden on the system here. If you can afford to take care of your treatment, do so. Don't be a burden on the system. Unless you don't have, really. Unless you don't have. And what I am telling you, this is a matter of halal and haram. If you ask our leaders, religious leaders, the jurists, the maraja, they tell you the same. All our maraja, they say, if you can afford buying a medical insurance, then you can't be a burden on the system. You can't take Medicare or Medicare or whatever. You are not allowed to do that. You can pay for your treatment, go ahead and pay. If you don't need the money from Social Security, don't take. Don't take for housing. Don't take for whatever. I don't know. It's detailed. I don't know these details. Don't hide your money and deal with cash and try to take advantage of the system because you're going to weaken the system. This system was created to save and salvage some poor and needy underprivileged don't be a burden be a plus be a plus to the educational system be a plus to the healthcare system be a plus to the economy be a plus to the political system be a plus to peace and security Try to encourage your children to do soup kitchen. Try to encourage your children to participate in food drive. Try to encourage your children to go and help the needy, the homeless. They build themselves, their characters, and they build their communities and societies. I admire those of you, I truly admire those who pay attention to the ills and the shortcomings of their own societies, wherever they live, whether they live in Europe, in Canada, in America, Australia, they say, this is my home too. Although those people, they don't share the religion with me. They don't share the language, but they are a human being. They are the citizens of this land, and I feel responsible for their well-being. So I would donate, I will give. I remember one of the great maraja that I met in Iraq, he personally said this story to me. He said, if you have, if you have poor and needy people in your area, in your city, in your state, don't send the money for charity elsewhere. Take care of that area. Take care of your area first. Don't send this money elsewhere. And this is what we must do. We must try to help. Even if the government is helping, the government is not doing enough. Still, we have some people who are in need. Europe is not free of poverty. America is not completely free of poverty. The recent survey says, we have 40 million people out of 300 million, 40 million people in America, they live under the poverty line. 
below the poverty line. 40 million people. And it would be very good when you try to help yourself. Try to help. So this is another point. The fifth point, we have to groom missionaries, du'at. We have to groom them. We have to prepare them. We have to encourage them. In America, we need a lot of du'at. وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ يَدْعُون comes from da'wa. And the person who does that is da'iyah. And the plural is du'at. Missionaries who invite people to do good in the Islamic field. We need to groom. We need to encourage. First, we need to build our own institutions in America. There are many Islamic colleges, universities, seminaries being established in America, which is something very good. And also, we have to encourage them to pursue their higher, higher studies outside America, if it takes to go outside. And this is the job of the parents and the families. When it comes to, especially when it comes to female preachers and teachers of Islam, female scholars, we have a huge shortages in female scholars in the field of Islamic studies. You have to encourage your daughters to go, to study, to be prepared, to graduate, to be able to teach at universities, colleges, Today, most of the Islamic studies programs are taught by non-Muslims in Europe and in America. We need to encourage our children to be missionaries. We need to learn from other religious traditions. If you have three children, four children, maybe you love for one of them to be a, law a lawyer, a doctor, physician, a businessman, but also also think of one of them to be a preacher, a scholar of Islam. A scholar of Islam would live dignified in this life and in the hereafter, if he has ikhlas. And then the last point that I mentioned before I leave you tonight is there is a lot of ignorance about Islam. Islam is the most misunderstood religion nowadays partly because of the media, partly because of what is happening in the Middle East, the sectarian war in the Middle East. And therefore, we need to encourage our children to go for the media, to work for the media, to dedicate their life to enlighten others about Islam, to give the beautiful picture about Islam, to speak the truth about Islam, to distinguish between the bad Islam based on Wahhabism and barbarism and terrorism and the authentic Islam based on the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Ahlul Bayt and the Holy Quran, the peaceful Islam, the moderate Islam, the genuine Islam, the merciful Islam. We have to teach the masses that today, unfortunately, we have these two types. Yes, we have Islam which is based on terrorism. And some people who call themselves Amir al muminin and they want to establish the Islamic Caliphate, which is based on corruption, immoralities, and devastation. We don't like that Islam. We don't advocate that Islam. That is not the true Islam. That is reverting to barbarism. The true Islam is the Islam of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his progeny, his family, the most peaceful people, the most tolerant people. There is a lot of ignorance about Islam nowadays. We should work very hard to enlighten people, to reach out to them as a father, as a mother, as a son, as a daughter, as a worker, as an engineer. You must do good in this field. 
teach Islam to others and reach out to others. وَقُلْ اعْمَلُوا فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ I leave you in the care and the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishing all the best for you especially while we are getting close to the end of this month the month of love, the month of mercy and the month of forgiveness Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Ya Allah